I hope I'm yes, yes. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm clear, right? Yeah. So honorable, honorable principal, principal of, of our institution, institution, Dr. C. Saidalevi, sir, principal of EMEA College of Arts and Science, Kondoti, Lieutenant Abdul Rashid, sir, uh, respected head of the department of PG, uh, PG department of English at EMEA Arts and Science College, College Kondoti, Mr. Roy P.P., sir, and uh, the keynote speaker of the day, Josie Joseph, sir. Coordinators of this online lecture series, Mr. Abdul Jalil and Mr. Muhammad Ali P. Uh, their delegates and the students who have joined for this afternoon session, uh, hearty welcome to the platform of Dialogia. In, at the outset, let me express my uh, happiness for being able to associate with the postgraduate and research department of English at EMEA College, Kondoti, with a research club for making this online lecture series possible. Uh, let me appreciate my colleague, Mr. Muhammad Ali P. and Mr. Abdul Jalil, uh, who are the coordinators of research club at EMEA College, Kondoti, and uh, EMEA College, Kondoti, and uh, KHM Unity Women's College. Uh, Mancheri. Uh, in fact, this is the second edition of program as far as the uh, PG Department of English at KHM UNT Women's College is considered. After being the successful uh, completion of the online lecture series during the last year, 2021, in association with the Department of History at KHM UNT Women's College Kondoti, uh, uh, KHM UNT Women's College Mancheri, we are into the second edition of online lecture series, and we are happy that this time we are associating with our neighboring institution. So we are spreading our hands and research wings with neighboring institution uh, as EMEA College Kondoti. So that gives immense pleasure for the department since we are into the serious academic process, especially in the pandemic stricken world order. We are utilizing the uh, academic possibilities made possible by the pandemic this time. And a hearty welcome to everyone. And uh, we are happy that uh, the, the whole series has been titled, uh, titled as Dialogia, where, as Mr. Jalil has rightly pointed out, we are thinking of um, uh, making the dialogues possible uh, between academic community and also spreading the wings to the society for making uh, such kinds of dialogues possible through the research. So uh, the whole series has been titled as uh, Reading Humanities Theories and Praxis, where we believe that uh, through uh, discussing and dialoguing uh, different possibilities of reading as well as humanities and the prospect and possibilities of reading, uh, we bring the academic community of students, researchers, and faculties together in a single platform uh, to make serious dialogues possible as part of the intellectual discourses in humanities. And uh, reading, as we know, is not simply a very silent or very simplistic, innocent process. Over the due course of years of 2,500 uh, years, uh, we know that from a very uh, liberal, humanistic kind of thought, we have traversed through different prospects as well as possibilities of reading. In fact, in association with the theory too. And we believe that uh, uh, from humanism, when we are traversing through this period, different kinds of phenomenologies of reading and theories are possible at this point. And when we come to human, humanities, definitely uh, from a humanistic period, we have reached the post-humanism and the digital humanities, where we in fact contradictory uh, or even conversing with the humanism and the possibilities of it and even the possibilities of post-human theories and discussions. So at this point, we believe that uh, a, an online lecture series uh, compared, I mean, conceptualized on uh, reading humanities theories and practices will definitely benefit those who are watching and viewing the reading as well as research possibilities in the field of humanities with respect to various domains. In fact, an, an era of disciplinary discussion has uh, coming to an end and we are becoming more interdisciplinary also. So the concept, uh, and from the concept of itself, it is very clear that we are uh, catering the disciplinary as well as the interdisciplinary dialogues possible. So I'm not going much to that extent. Uh, we are here in this platform 
uh, to discuss as part of Dialogia. So uh, we have immense pleasure to welcome you all. So first of all, let me invite Dr. C. Said Ali sir, who is the beloved principal of KHM Unity Women's College Manjeri, who has been rendering all the support for all the creative as well as academic programs of uh, Department of English at Unity Women's College Manjeri. So wishing you a hearty welcome, sir. Now we have uh, a beloved friend of mine and the principal of EMEA College of Arts and Science College, Kondoti, Lieutenant Abdul Rashid, sir. Uh, it has been immense pleasure for us uh, for having him uh, with, uh, with us in this program. So let me express my wholehearted welcome to Lieutenant Abdul Rashid, sir, uh, to the platform of Dialogia. Now we have the keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Josie Joseph, sir. Already, uh, Joseph Joseph, sir, had associated with the Department of English at Unity Women's College, Mancheri, for other intellectual discourses. Uh, he is a very prolific writer and speaker, and also an actor, too. And uh, he is very uh, famous through his uh, intellectual deliberations. And he has been very familiar for the cultural and academic world of, uh, uh, I mean, academic world of Keralite community too. So it gives us immense pleasure and proud to welcome Josie Joseph sir on behalf of two departments and the research clubs of PG Department of English at UNT Women's College Manjeri and EMEA College of Arts and Science College, uh, Arts and Science Condotti. So let me express a, a proud welcome you uh, to you sir to this platform. And uh, uh, and uh, it gives me immense pleasure, uh, though, uh, for formality to welcome both the coordinators of this program. In fact, they are, uh, uh, their passion for academia has made this program possible. So let me ex uh, appreciate both of them, Mr. Abdul Jalil and Mr. Muhammad uh, Alipi, for making this possible for the intellectual academic community. And uh, all program is successful only uh, by the delegates and making the forum active through your delegation. So it gives us immense pleasure that most of them have, most of the academic uh, community have expressed their uh, serious interest to be the part of this program. So we welcome you all for being the, uh, the part of intellectual discourse in this afternoon. And uh, let me welcome my students also to this program. So once again, let me express a wholehearted welcome to each and everyone who have joined here in this platform. We believe that those who are viewing academics as well, especially humanities and reading humanities will benefit through this uh, lecture series. So once again, party welcome to the platform of Dialogia. Thank you all. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, now let me welcome uh, the principal of Unity Women's College, Jai Dilvi sir, to deliver a verification speech. Jai Dilvi sir. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yes sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Welcome. Welcome to know. Welcome to know. Yes. Hello? Yes, sir. Welcome to know, sir. Welcome to know, sir. Welcome to know, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Respected Chief Guest of today, Dr. Josie Joseph, Head of the Department of English, faculty members from EMEA College, students from both the college. Today, we are online for lecture series, Reading Humanities, Structure, Sign and Writing. As we all are aware, Reading books is vary from other readings. 
or we can ask some questions what are books or what are not the books when we ask these questions certain difficulty arise in our mind is the brochure of a railway station or the brochure of a cookery guide is a book or what is the difference between these brochures and the books like paradise lost or divine comedy or satanic verses or what is the difference between the uh, books of medicine theology or literature for clearing these type of doubts let me say a piece of literature is entirely different from a treatise on astronomy or economics or philosophy or even from history because literature is dealt with a particular type of readers truly speaking it is directly dealing with men and women with a concept of men and women as we are human beings we are interest, intensely interested in the welfare of men and women their lives their motives their passions their relationships hence reading should focus on these type of motives i think this webinar will focus on what actual reading is and what is not i know the personalities the distinguished personalities online are adequately perfect for discussing such a subject and let me conclude wishing all you all the best for the function and those who attend the functions thank you thank you all thank you sir for your encouraging words uh, now let me invite uh, lieutenant abdul rashid sir the principal of the college to felicitate the rashid sir hello yes sir am i loud and clear? clear yes yes sir okay the most respected chair of this uh, inaugural function of dialogia online lecture series on reading humanities theories and praxis mr jalil head of the department of unity women's college english department dr dr ak shahina mol the most respected principal of unity women's college dr said alvi sir coordinator of uh, one of the coordinators of this online lecture series my dear friend mohammad ali sir and today's resource person josi joseph sir my dear colleagues eminent teachers from the department of unity women's college students of various semesters who approach reading quite seriously i don't want to take much time because everybody is looking for the wonderful lecture of josie joseph sir on roland bats but as a principal i am so happy very much delighted to be here with you on this wonderful lecture series the very first day of this or the first session of the uh, online lecture series collaboration makes wonders we used to say like that especially in the th in 21st century if you take any technological advancement or if you take any other inventions nobel laureates people talk about a leader and we add another one another another tag at all it means that a team teamwork makes great results i am pretty sure 
collaboration of these two eminent departments, Department of English from Unity Women's College and the Department of English of EMEA College, of my college, will make great success and will bring about lots of wonderful things in future, especially with respect to uh, research and publications. I'm so happy to be here, as I just said before, with this introductory lecture of Dialogia, um, online lecture series on uh, reading a uh, humanities theories and practices. The first lecture by the Josie Joseph sir, um, as I read the brochure, structure, sign, and writing, the text of Roland Barthes. And uh, uh, from the English department, I just want to mention something about Roland Barthes, even though I don't know much about him. But I love to talk about him in the sense that um, I think I'm audible, right? Yes, I'm sir. audible. Yes, yes. I'm audible. Okay. 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 Fine. Um, once we take the transition period, or what we classified from the liberal humanism into the arena of different types of theories, there arises the legendary figure Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes. Interestingly enough, his thoughts gives us a transition into different types of theories. And as he changes from one standpoint into another, rather than changing as he grows or he brings up from one thought to another. And such a beautiful theorist, philosopher, semiotician, such a great, great man of 20th century. And I guess Jose Joseph sir, will give us a wonderful lecture on him, especially um, structure, sign, and writing. So I'm not, I don't want to take much time. Uh, so I wish the program, the lecture series, to be taken into another level in the days to come so that everybody can cherish it. Everybody can be proud of that this collaboration has brought great results. I want to wish all success for this program and I would like to motivate our English department to take it to another level in collaboration with the Department of English, um, KHM, Unity Women's College. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Dr. Josie Joseph is Associate Professor in the Postgraduate and Research Department of English at St. Virgin's Autonomous College, Changanashiri. He has 28 years of experience in teaching undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Uh, he, his areas of specialization include Shakespeare drama, 20th century literature, literary theory, and cultural studies. A bilingual writer, public speaker, translator, and amateur actor, he is an active presence in the academic and uh, cultural circles of Kerala. His translations have appeared in Oxford and Macmillan anthologies. He has published several research papers, including in peer-reviewed journals. He has also contributed, a chap contributed chapters to critical anthologies. And his profile uh, goes on like that. So I don't want to, you know, uh, consume much time speaking about his profile. Instead of doing that, let me welcome Josie Joseph, sir, uh, to uh, officially inaugurate this lecture series and deliver his talk on the topic structure, sign, and writing the text of Roland Barthes. Welcome, Josie Joseph, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I understand this is the first lecture in the series, and so I've um, been asked to inaugurate the series as well. So, uh, on behalf of all of you present here, and with your permission, let me announce the uh, series inaugurated. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here today, and at the very outset, I want to uh, thank the organizers of the seminar series, the 
two honorable principals of both colleges, uh, KHM Unity uh, College for Women, uh, Manjeri, and uh, EMEA College, Kondoti, and the two heads of departments, uh, English departments there, uh, the coordinators of this program, particularly my friend Muhammad Ali, and all the respected teachers and the honorable dignitaries, uh, participants, dear students, good afternoon and hearty greetings to you all. Uh, I have fond memories of uh, Unity College. I came there way back in 2014, in July 2014, I still remember, uh, to give the keynote lecture on uh, the two-day seminar on Shakespeare, the Singularities uh, seminar, which has now become very famous. I think I gave the keynote lecture for the second edition, uh, if I remember right. And now singularity seminars are perhaps the best in the whole state. But in those days, it was just the beginning of, uh, uh, of the series. And uh, my lecture was also published in the journal Singularities there. Uh, and, uh, and ever since, there's no looking back uh, for me, I've been giving lectures all along, but that journey actually began uh, with that Shakespeare lecture in 2014. So I'm grateful to uh, the college and my good friend, Dr. P.K. Babu, who was at that time the head of the department there. Um, and uh, this lecture was supposed to be given last year. Muhammad Ali has been persistently uh, inviting me to give a lecture. I was supposed to give a lecture on uh, historiography and narrative last year, but uh, it was actually even uh, announced the date, but for some reason it did not materialize. And so uh, when he gave me the invitation again this year, I grabbed it immediately because I, I, I want to uh, compensate for the absence last year. So thank you, Muhammad, for persisting with me. And, uh, and thank you all of you for being here. Now, today I want to talk about Roland Barth. And the title I've uh, chosen is, uh, has already been mentioned here, uh, Structure, Sign and Writing, the text of Roland Bath. Now, the title is actually uh, a play on Derrida's famous uh, phrase, the, the title of Derrida's famous 1966 uh, lecture, Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences, the lecture that he gave at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, for that uh, four-day grand colloquium on structuralism. It was intended as a, 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 as a triumph of uh, continental theory, particularly structuralism in America, in all, all the world. And this is for the first time that a contingent of continental theorists came to America, went to America. And Roland Barth was there, Lucien Goldman was there, Thadaro, Jean Hippolyte, Jacques Lacan, all these big, big names, they're all structuralist, structuralist philosophers and structuralist thinkers. They all went there. And uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida was actually a last minute substitute. And he was a last speaker. He spoke only the fourth day of the seminar. And then uh, he, in that, his was the last uh, presentation. And he read out this paper. And with that presentation, we now realize that structuralism ended or as a movement as the most decisive dominant philosophical movement ended and post-structuralism officially got inaugurated so it's one of the ironies of uh, the academic uh, history that uh, a conference which was meant to celebrate the achievements of of, of structuralism ended up as its very nemesis or it's it's it's, it's very uh, rejection or this very very uh, very uh, very uh, Countering, so to say. Now, um, Roland Barth began as a structuralist. I just, I just want to spend some time on those those key words in my title: structure, sign, uh, and writing, and also the word text, and by implication the word play, because as I said uh, earlier, th this title is actually uh, an adaptation of Derrida's expression or phrase, which is structure, sign, and play. Now, these are some of the terms that obsessed Roland Barth all his life. 
uh, as uh, the uh, Honorable Principal Lieutenant Abdul Rashid just mentioned, uh, Roland Bhatt is a, a, a philosopher or a thinker who kept growing, who kept evolving. He began as a structuralist. He was perhaps the most important structuralist of his generation. Jonathan Culler calls him the structuralist. Uh, and uh, he went to Baltimore as a structuralist. A paper that he read there is titled to write an intransitive verb, which is uh, rooted in the structuralist idiom, so to say. But then the Bath who came back from Baltimore is already a post-structuralist. I'm not saying that this is completely under the influence of Derrida, but uh, perhaps the Derridian idea of deconstruction uh, helped the process, but this is actually a whole uh, climate of uh, transition that was taking place in, in in France and you in particular and Europe in general. So there were many influences, many streams of thought, and it is actually a cumulative shift, a, a kind of paradigm shift in in, in thinking or in, in in the ways of thinking, in ways of looking at the world, in framing uh, your engagement with the world at large. So this transition from structuralism to post-structuralism. Well, Bath, who was the most uh, famous structuralist practitioner, I want to say something about Bath the structuralist as well, uh, became later one of the leading post-structuralist thinkers. Right. So when you think of post-structuralist theory, the names come th th those names that come to mind immediately are Jacques Derrida, perhaps the first name, and then. Uh, Michel Foucault, Jacques Lacan, and Roland Barthes, these four, Julia Kristeva, these five are the big names of structuralist, uh, I'm sorry, post structuralist philosophy. Okay, now, uh, uh, Barth, uh, I, 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 I will talk about his particular text and uh, I'll try and locate the this, this particular transition from the structuralist to the post structuralist. But he was not just a theorist, he was much more than that. You know, uh, among all these, these names that I mentioned, uh, I have no doubt that Bath will survive. I don't know how many of the other thinkers or theorists will be read and discussed, say, uh, 20 years from now or 50 years from now. Uh, I think all of them will remain, all of them will remain valid and significant. Uh, but uh, I just uh, want to read out a couple of observations made by one Susan Sontag. Uh, Susan Sontag, who edited the Bath Reader, Bath Reader, in her introduction, it begins uh, her observations on Roland Bath as, uh, or this way, teacher, man of letters, moralist, philosopher of culture, kinesier of strong ideas, protean, autobiographer, of all the intellectual notables who have emerged since the Second World War in France, Roland Barth is the one whose work I am most certain will endure. This is Susan Sontag. Then, uh, Wayne C. Booth, writing in 1979, when Barth was still alive, says, the man who, about Roland Barth says, describes him as a man who may well be the strongest influence on American criticism today. Then Jonathan Culler, who wrote the monograph on Roland Barth in the Fontana Modern Master series and which was later reissued as uh, in the Oxford Very Short Introduction series. Uh, Bath, a very short introduction series, wonderful introduction. Uh, I strongly recommend this book to all the students here. If you want to know more about Bath, perhaps this is a good starting point. Uh, he says, what has Bath become? You know, this is the revised edition and uh, writing in around 2000, I think, the turn of the century. He says, what has Bath become 20 years after his death? The simplest answer is that he has become a writer. Now, this is the first point that I want to highlight, that among all the post-structuralist thinkers, Bath was the most creative. So he will survive, if not for the... The, the profundity of his thoughts or the density of his arguments or, or all those theories uh, and uh, critical thinking, he will be, be remain or will survive as a writer. You say this about Sigmund Freud as well. 
because much of Freud's ideas have, un, have now been rejected by uh, psychologists and psychoanalysts all over the world. But Freud is still a very prominent uh, thinker because he's an excellent writer. I love to read Freud. Those who have read Freud will agree with me. He's such a delightful writer of, of, of very imaginative and creative prose. Now, Bath is, uh, is perhaps the most creative among all the uh, structuralist and post structuralist uh, uh, thinkers and philosophers. He was unique. Uh, he never produced a huge book, you know, or maybe any one uh, meta narrative uh, text of, of a grand theory like Derrida's deconstruction or Foucault's discourses on power or analysis of structures of power or epistemies uh, or Foucault's huge book on, say, Madness and Civilization, which was his doctoral thesis running to about 900 pages in the original text. And the English translation is actually a, a, a reductive uh, text of around 300 pages. I'm talking about Foucault's first book. Uh, Bath has nothing like that to offer. He is a man of parts. Again, Jonathan Culler describes him as a man of parts. Uh, he's something here, something that he is a master of fragments, so to say. The master of fragmentary writing. And uh, he's also very passionate in his writings, very emotional. There is so much of his personal life, ironical to say this about Roland Barthes because he was a great uh, champion of the death of the author. Uh, but uh, as Derrida himself said, another uh, you know, uh, champion of the post-structuralist thought is as all writing is autobiographical. So uh, the uh, the death of the author is, of course, a very valid argument because only if you take out the centrality of the author, that the persona of the author can writing exist and become meaningful. And because Bath's fundamental basic argument is that it is the reader who constructs the text and it is the very process of reading that constitute the, the, the text. And all his life he was interested in the in the structuration of narrative or the structuration of writing how is a text constituted how does a, a text come into being okay now i want to go back to those words the key words of my title structure sign writing uh, and text now and also play by implication structure i've already explained to you he was a structuralist and uh, he uh, used the Saussurian model, the linguistic model, uh, and applied it to all cultural practices and cultural expressions. Uh, his most famous book, perhaps, is uh, Mythologies. Now, uh, this is partly the, the method is structuralist, or rather semiotic, which, you know, emerged out of structuralism. It was Saussure's great dream to establish this uh, this this science of science, as he called it, the la this larger system, uh, which can explain all forms of uh, science, all forms of, uh, uh, of, of 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 science systems, and language being just one among the many. And uh, Saussure famously said, "There is no such di discipline at the moment, uh, but it has every right to exist, and there will come a time when." Uh, you'll have a, a semiology of uh, the various science systems of this larger st structure. And that Saussurean dream was actually realized by Roland Barth. Uh, and by the time Roland Barth, you know, uh, wrote all his articles and put all these cultural every practices of everyday life, popular cultural texts uh, and uh, put them to uh, a, a very rigorous ideological scrutiny and looked at it, the structuration and the patterns, the codes, uh, and all those uh, semiotic conventions and explained all that in linguistic terms. Uh, uh, well, uh, this became very popular and very familiar. Now, perhaps Bach's greatest contribution to the world of humanities or the world of social science studies or sciences is perhaps this 
this method of semiotic analysis of everyday culture. Now, uh, if uh, this again is my request or strong recommendation to all the students listening to me, if you're planning to read just one book by Roland Barth, let it be this book, Mythologies. Mythology, uh, by the word mythology, well, he is using it in a particular sense. By the word myth, he means some cultural practice that is taken for granted, that is considered natural. Uh, it could be an idea, it could be a, a, a practice or a ritual or a ceremony or a spectacle or a form of entertainment. And then what he does is he analyzes its structure and then he analyzes its ideological implications. For example, there's this famous essay on toys. He looks at contemporary French toys and he looks at the the kind of toys that are given to girls and the kind of toys that are given to boys and uh, the kind of toys given to children. His basic argument is that, you know, uh, there is a fundamental mistake in the way we look at to toys or the way we select toys for children. We assume that the child is a miniature adult and so we give the child all these uh, objects of the adult life in miniature forms. So a child is given a small car. Why should a child be given a small car? Well, you're actually conditioning the child to adult life so that when he grows up, he will love cars and he will learn how to use a car or he will want to buy one. Uh, and so you're actually preparing the child for the adult world. Similarly, all the toys. And what is this logic of giving a child a, a gun to play with? Think about it. It's violence, actually, epistemic violence, right? Uh, you're, you're actually uh, instilling or preparing the child to kill when he grows up, right? And then, of course, you can cover it up with this grand uh, nationalist or patriotic uh, arguments about doing it for the country, being a soldier and all that, all, all those things. So Bath is looking at the, um, the, the, the both the intentions and the implications of the choice of toys. Uh, and I need not talk about the gender, uh, gendering of toys. I, I suppose all youngsters listening to me know the, 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 the gender politics of, say, uh, Kinder Joy. Why is pink chosen for girls? Why is blue for boys? And even if you look at those so small toys, uh, which come, you know, with the toffee, you will see there is this uh, a kind of uh, gender distinction, if not discrimination. I, I don't want to use that word discrimination, but at least there is this distinction or difference, right? Uh, so I'm just giving you one example. There are so many numerous examples of this Bathian method. He looks at uh, the world of wrestling. He looks at all out wrestling and boxing. And he gives a semiotic analysis, the difference between the two. Then he looks at the uh, soap uh, uh, powder and detergents, right? Uh, and the advertisements uh, and all those uh, narratives, those, the, 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 the storyline, for example, uh, all these soaps, bath soaps or washing soaps or even toothpaste, they were all uh, this uh, narrative about the enemy and the and your agent who will kill that enemy or who, who will uh, you know force that enemy out of your territory right so in the case of a toothpaste that enemy is your kitan so you use colgate and then you think of all those ads and the form uh, the excess of the form uh, and uh, the rigorous action of your uh, uh, toothpaste soldiers, the foot soldiers of Colgate. Uh, same applies to Lux or uh, Surf, Excel or whatever. And you have that a brilliant semiotic analysis of this in this book, right? Uh, and and uh, there's another essay on wine and milk. I can go on and give a whole uh, lecture on this, but I want to talk about the other uh, texts as well. Now, I've been teaching Bath for more than two decades, uh, so I'm really at a loss where to begin and how to structure this lecture. We're already 30 minutes uh, into this uh, seminar, and I don't know how long I can take. Maybe I'll speak for about 40 minutes or so and then take a few questions. Anyway, 
you know, going back to my title, structure, sign, and uh, writing. All his life, all his writing life, Bach was obsessed with the idea of writing. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's any other thinker or philosopher who has written as much about the idea of writing as Roland Barth. Uh, if you take his most famous essay, uh, The Death of the Author, you will see Barth defining or describing writing in so many different ways. There are some a dozen or so descriptive statements about writing alone. And uh, you will find this in all our uh, major critical texts, of whether it is to write an intransitive verb or criticism as language, one of the earlier texts, or uh, is a seminal essay from word to text, or the pleasure of the text, or the theory of the text. In all these uh, essays, you will find Bach thinking about and reflecting on the ideas of the text, the ideas of writing. Okay, and then the sign again, this transition from structuralism, post-structuralism is actually centered around the, the nature of the sign or the, or the recognition or the realization of the nature of the sign. You know, I'll explain this later when I discuss that essay from work to the text. Okay, now uh, what I'm going to do next is to introduce some of his works. His first work or maybe before that, I'll say something about uh, Roland Barthes in general. He, uh, unlike the other big names, the, Fou the Foucaults and Derrida's, you know, Bath was unlucky in his academic career because he was uh, a sick child all his life. Uh, I mean, all his uh, childhood, he was unwell. He had pulmonary tuberculosis, and so he was in and out of the sanatoriums all through his childhood, all through his student days. Uh, and he had a very unhappy childhood. He lost his father when he was just a few months old. His father was a naval officer who got uh, killed in the First World War, and uh, at the beginning of the First World War, in fact. Uh, and Bath was brought up by his mother, and he was uh, obsessively attached to his mother. Uh, again, I can't think of any other prominent writer or philosopher who was as obsessed with Bath as uh, to his mother as Bath was. Uh, I don't know if of the obsession is the right word or should I use any stronger word than that. Uh, you know, uh, maybe this is some this kind of mother fixation that uh, that compelled Bath to remain a bachelor all his life. He did not marry. He was homosexual, in fact. He did not get along with women, I mean, other uh, women. And maybe there's some psychology uh, or psychological compulsion, a Freudian analysis or whatever. But he was, uh, uh, he was madly obsessed with his mother. He loved and respected his mother. And he lived all his life with his mother. He wouldn't leave, go anywhere uh, you know, uh, for a long period. Even when he would go for lectures, he wanted to get back at the earliest to his mother. And uh, uh, he, his mother died when he was 62 years old. And Bach was 62, uh, rather old. His mother was into her 80s at the time. And she was very old and very, very weak. And she died. But that death was shattering, was devastating. Uh, to Bath. He lived only three more years. This was in 1977 and Bath lived only three more years and all those three years he was very, very unhappy and uh, and there is a uh, the last book that he published during his lifetime. It's titled Camera Lucida. It's a series of uh, I have the book here. Yeah, this book. Beautiful book, small book. It is full of pictures, photographs. It's actually a reflection on photography. And the first part, you have his general observations about photography. And the second part is actually about his mother. This is a book that he wrote after his mother's demise. And then he says, uh, I'm not mourning, I'm suffering. 
So he doesn't, I'm not grieving, I'm not mourning, I'm suffering. And that was the kind of attachment he had with his mother. He would spend long hours at his mother's bed, that room where she lived and died. And uh, so uh, why am I saying all this? I just want to uh, you know, convey to my audience the kind of uh, emotional person that he was. Passion is a word that you always uh, associate with, uh, uh, with, 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 with Bath. Uh, now, he, because he was unwell, he could not pass the aggregation test, the kind of uh, national eligibility test or entrance examination for selecting candidates to, the, to university education. And so uh, he could not go to any of these big universities. Nevertheless, he uh, studied at uh, University of uh, Paris and uh, read the classics and all, but he did not take a PhD. But this, again, one thing, great uh, scholar, philosopher, academician who did not have a PhD. And because he didn't have a PhD, because he didn't come through that aggregation system, he did not get a good job, actually, in any of these leading universities. He was teaching uh, as a part-time teacher in one of the one or the other of these fringe institutes. Uh, it's only at the fag end of his life in around 1976, I think, yeah, 76, he got appointed as the professor uh, at College de France, which is the highest uh, academic institution in France. And this was under the strong recommendation of Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault wanted Bath to be uh, to be teaching there. He was already a professor there. You all know Michel Foucault was the professor of the history of systems of thought. At College de France, professors can choose the title of their own designations. So for Foucault, it was, Foucault was professor of the history of systems of thought. Chinda professor. When it was Bath's turn, the title that he chose was professor of literary semiology. So he wanted to combine two of his greatest uh, passions or intellectual obsessions, literature and semiology. So he became a professor of literary semiology, but he could teach there only for four years. And in 1980, he died suddenly, tragically. He was knocked down by a laundry van, actually. Uh, and he, he just had uh, lunch with Foucault at, uh, uh, and uh, Francois Mitron, the prominent French politician who later became president of France, was also there. They were all friends, and so Bath was having lunch with them. And he came out after this lunch, and he and he was crossing the street, and uh, right in front of Sorbonne, and the, he was knocked down by a laundry van, uh, a laundry van, and the the, the 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 driver was actually inebriated, was was drunk, and uh, he uh, stayed in the hospital for a whole month, and then he died. And his friends say that because he was so depressed, he didn't have the will to survive this accident. He didn't want, he didn't have that zest for life. Uh, he didn't want to live actually. And he, he was suggesting to his friend that he would prefer to die because, he, he, because his mother's absence bothered him so much. He didn't want to live. Anyway, that's so much about Bartha man. I didn't actually didn't intend to say so much about uh, the philosopher who, who introduces this concept of the death of the author, the author who talked about the death of the author anyway. Uh, then it's the first book that he wrote uh, that came out in 1953. It's titled uh, Writing Degree Zero. This was actually a response to Jean-Paul Sartre and Sartre's tract, What is Literature, in which Sartre talked about uh, the need for political commitment for all writers. For Sartre, writing is a political act. So if you, a writer has to be committed, has to be politically committed. Uh, of course, Sartre had his quarrels with Marxism, uh, but nevertheless, he, 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 uh, um, he was a Marxist to, uh, for all, uh, at least in principle, even though he had his, his quarrels were with the party, with the dogmatic structures of uh, the party and not with the, the the basic principles of Marxism. Anyway, now uh, Bath's response was, uh, no, 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 writing is something completely different. Writing 
uh, is a, an activity which exists for itself. Uh, it is an expression of language and it has no uh, extraneous you know, uh, intention or purpose. Uh, it is more performant, you know. You, this might sound like the uh, the argument or the logic of the arts for arts sake movement or the, the, the decadent philosophy. Uh, there is some parallels, I agree, but this is slightly different. Uh, Bart's argument. Uh, this is an idea that he would take up and would return repeatedly for the rest of his writing career. That, that writing as a as a performance, writing as a performative gesture. Okay. Now, the second book, the book that uh, made him very popular, uh, I've already mentioned this, is actually a collection of the monthly column that he wrote for a leading newspaper. And the column was titled Mythology of the Month. And for ev so every month he would take up some cultural practice, cultural expression, or uh, and he, he uses the word myth to... Uh, describe this practice as a kind of cultural delusion. You something that we take as natural, take as granted, without uh, thinking about its history, without thinking about the its purpose, without thinking about the meaning, all those things. So uh, this is actually the uh, a combination of uh, a structuralist analysis and ideological criticism. So. Uh, and this is Bathian semiotic analysis of contemporary culture. Okay, then um, now I want to introduce this book. This is the language of fashion. There's a typical uh, structuralist analysis of fashion uh, using the Saussurean model. Bath looks at the world of fashion, and he looks at all those codes, conventions, patterns. The, the long, uh, the underlying long, the larger system, which makes possible all the individual expressions, the paroles, right? Just as uh, Saussure talked about the long and the parole of language, Bath uses the same model and talks about all these. He also talks about the syntagmatic and paradigmatic combinations, you know, all those things. Something that he would later apply about food as well. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just give you a, a, an example of the, the logic. You know, uh, you know how the syntagmatic paradigmatic relations work in language, right? A syntagmatic relationship is a relationship, a linear kind of relationship uh, that exists between the different elements or units uh, within a, a, a given structure, say a sentence. So uh, when you say um, uh, the children are playing or uh, Rama killed Ravana, the, the age-old uh, example uh, of grammarians, grammar teachers. Okay, now you have that linear relationship between the subject, the object, and the verb. Okay, that's syntagmatic, and then you have the paradigmatic relationship, which is the relationship between uh, an element present in a structure and other elements, we, which can replace that particular element. Right. So instead of Rama. Um, or Rama killed Ravana, instead of Ravana you can say Rama killed at Bali, which would also be uh, logically and grammar, grammatically correct, valid. Okay, so uh, so this relationship between Bali and uh, Ravana is a paradigmatic relationship. Now, if you think about the, uh, the clothes that we wear, there is a syntagmatic and paradigmatic relationship. For example, I'm wearing a shirt and a pants. Now, the relationship between the shirt and the pants or the trousers is syntagmatic. It's a linear relationship. But I can choose to wear a, a kurta instead of this shirt. I can just change this and put on a t-shirt or a jubba or a kurta. And that would be a paradigmatic uh, uh, choice, right? So you can... Uh, and instead of uh, the... Um, Trousers, say if I change to a pair of jeans or a dhoti, munda, uh, or a three fourth or whatever. See, this is, I'm just giving an example of how this logic operates. Similarly, with food, the syntagmatic, paradigmatic choices and the, the, the long of food, the different uh, categories, 
classifications there are starters there are uh, begin you know you know opening courses there are main courses there are deserts all those things and Bath does it brilliantly beautifully he is a master of uh, of semiotic analysis so he does you know, now uh, Bath is famous for three or four things so this is one thing the semiotic analysis of everyday culture then he is famous uh, as the proponent of the idea of the death of the author. I wanted to say something about that. So that is uh, perhaps the one essay that made him very famous in the academic world. Uh, made him uh, the uh, prominent post-structuralist thinker. Uh, and that essay was written in 1967 uh, after the 1966 paper at Baltimore to write an intransitive world, which was uh, the end of Bath, the structure list. And then this essay uh, marks this transition of Bath, the structure list, to Bath, the post structure list. Uh, and this was actually uh, presented at a seminar in America and published in America in 1967 in English. If you look at um, several uh, critical anthologies, this essay is dated as 1968, Death of the Author, 1968, which is wrong. 1968 is actually the French publication. And because Bath is French, we people just assume that we must have wrote it originally in French and they go by that French date of publication. Actually, he had presented it already in America and English and, present, and, and published it in a, 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 a cultural popular cultural magazine called Aspen. Uh, Aspen in the 60s was a very a, a kind of multimedia journal. Uh, the issue would come to you as a as a whole package uh, as a in a box and you will have something to read. You will have a couple of uh, uh, video uh, tapes, musical uh, uh, tapes, uh, recordings or whatever, and then some certain curios, objects, stationery, this is that kind of a, a product and avant-garde if you could say a radical publication uh, new generation stuff and Bart's essay was published death of the other was published uh, in that uh, in that magazine anyway so that is the uh, second uh, claim or reason to Bart's fame and the third i would say his Bart, the literary hedonist it was somebody who champion the reader's right even to read idiosyncratically and to elicit whatever meanings that he or she wants and to do whatever uh, she wants with the text. And for Bath, reading is all about play. The ludic principle is central to uh, Bath. Again, the play, the Deridian play. Of course, you can relate it to the Deridian play. Uh, because it is because of that Deridian play, the idea of deference, of dissemination, of, of dissemination, uh, of intertextuality and all that, that uh, this playing, the act of playing is possible. So, um, and uh, for Bath, reading is something that gives pleasure and something that should give pleasure. And the pleasure, it's no ordinary pleasure. He would later make a distinction between simple pleasure and uh, juicens, what he, he he calls it, French word, which means orgasmic or ecstatic pleasure. And reading uh, a text should end up in that kind of ecstasy uh, and kind of play. So literary hedonism is a concept that you associate with uh, Roland Barthes. And then, of course, his ideas about the text the concept of intertextuality uh, with the term was introduced or, or, or coined by Julia Kristeva and introduced by Julia Kristeva. She relates it to uh, Bakhtin's uh, dialogism, Bakhtin's idea of uh, polyphony, heteroglossia and all that and also the Susurian uh, linguistic models and also there's certain arguments in, uh, in, in, in uh, Russian formalism and combining it with 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 freudian and post freudian psychoanalytical uh, thinking so uh, she introduced this concept but it was roland bath who made this concept popular now what is intertextuality intertextuality simply or maybe i'll come to that later when i discuss uh, the death of the author uh, now let me just uh, uh, 
uh, run through the other uh, major works of uh, Roland Bath. Now, uh, Bath went to Japan and when he, for a visit, he spent a few weeks there and he came back and wrote a book, The Empire of Science, which is a semiotic analysis. He didn't know anything about Japan at all. He doesn't know the language or the culture or the system. So he looks at the whole of Japan as a, as a set of signifiers, a signs, and as a semiologist, he an analyzes, uh, and analyzes uh, and he uh, puts to semiotic analysis all those uh, sites, all those uh, scenes and spectacles that he witnesses. So that's a book, uh, Empire of Signs. Uh, his argument is that uh, in Japan, everything is a sign with a signifier with no signified. Uh, and uh, he gives a very uh, subtle, uh, you know, nuanced arguments uh, to uh, prove his point anyway. Then we have uh, his book, Elements of Semiology, which is again the rooted in the structuralist uh, logic and uh, the an expression of Bath, the semiotician or the semiologist. Then Criticism and Truth is a collection of his critical essays or literary criticism. Bath was a wonderful reader of uh, literature. He has written uh, extensively about a number of writers. There's a whole book on Racine, uh, on Racine. And uh, he has written so much about Flaubert, about uh, Balzac. Uh, he loved Balzac's novella, Zarazine. And he has written a whole book on that uh, that story will come to that. Uh, so he was a, 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 a great a reader and a wonderful literary critic. Then um, there's another interesting book by Roland about the Lover's Discourse, Fragments, uh, which is uh, a, a textual analysis of the, the language of romance and the conventions of romance. Uh, very idiosyncratic and uh, not properly structured uh, a book again in fragments you have the term in the subtitle as well the typical Bathian uh, uh, you know excess textual excess so to say uh, i want to talk about another book this is there's a very curious title it's titled roland bath by roland bath wonderful book i don't know how to describe this book slim volume in 200 pages full of pictures it is his autobiography but this is an autobiography with a difference uh, it is almost uh, like uh, 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 Roland Bath writing a fictional biography of a man called Roland Bath or ba Bath writing his own biography and then there's also uh, so much about his life again you have pictures of his parents grandparents uh, early life and all those things uh, but at the same time there are also theoretical observations analysis fragments uh, jokes puns all those things are there uh, and in the opening page he gives a word of caution to all readers it must all be considered as if spoken by a character in a novel so you should treat this as a piece of fiction as a piece of fictional writing and as if this is about a fictional character so but there is so much of his personal life in it it is uh, autobiographical no doubt about it but it is autobiography with a difference okay uh, now mm, i want to talk about yeah the death of the other maybe i'll talk about that book I want to now this is uh, his collection of essays, image, music, text, perhaps the finest collection of essays, which includes some of his most famous and greatest pieces. Uh, you have his famous essay, Introduction to the Structural Analysis of Narratives, which is considered one of the finest critical pieces of structuralist writing. Introduction to the Structural Analysis of Narratives. So he gives a model, the structuralist model, to analyze narratives, a very seminal text. Then 
there is this famous essay on this the struggle with the angel which is a textual analysis of uh, a, a passage in the bible the genesis uh, a particular chapter the 10 verses of chapter 32 of genesis and here is Roland Barthes brilliant textual analysis and then of course you have the death of the author in 1967 essay and uh, as well as the 1971 essay from word to text these are in my opinion the most important essays that Barth ever wrote the death of the author and from word to text and there's also this beautiful uh, essay on writers intellectuals teachers I, I, I just love that essay now I want to say something about the death of the author and uh, maybe just read out some of those key arguments uh, about writing. I told you he is the one thinker, philosopher who has written more about writing, the idea of writing, the idea of the text than anybody else. Now, in this essay, he defines writing as that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject slips away, the negative where all identity is lost, starting with the very identity of the body writing. So uh, Bart's argument is that, you know, we need to take out the centrality of the author and instead see the, 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 the this is as a text. Now, what is the difference between uh, a work and a text you know that is what he elaborates in the other essay maybe i'll just say something about that straight away because this is related to the the, the post-structuralist notion of textuality what do you mean by textuality right textuality is a nature of the text this uh this this notion that a text is just a set of signifiers and no signified at all you don't believe in the signified anymore because you inhabit a world full of signifiers and one signifier can only lead to another signifier so uh, there is this infinite deferment of the process of signification uh, what Derrida would famously describe as deferance that term that he coined uh, as against the differential principle of Saussure. For Saussure, the operative logic of all signs is different. One sign is different from another. Red is different from blue. Blue is different from brown. Okay. And so it is a difference that is at the heart of this whole uh, you know, process of signification. Now, Derrida accepts that, but also argues that, you know, uh, it's not only that uh, different signs are not only different from one another, but this process of signification is also deferred. And how long? Well, eternally. You can only proceed one from one signifier to another. Now, I don't know whether the undergraduate students, at least listening to me, are able to comprehend this or accept this, that uh, because we are all used to this familiar comforting faith in meanings right this is what all teachers do i also go to a class and then read the lines and explain the meaning to the students this is what the poet means this is what the text means but the post-structuralist philosopher says no this is just an illusion a myth or maybe it is just a contingent category this meaning is a is a provisional entity meaning is provisional as uh, Peter Barry would argue. Uh, it is just for the time being. Or you just say that this is a meaning. But no, uh, there is no meaning as such. That meaning is something that you have temporarily, provisionally uh, taken or, 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 or attributed. Yeah, the reader attributing that meaning to the text. Or you think it is a meaning okay so this is the idea of, uh, of 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 the text as text is simply a set of signifiers with immense possibilities infinite semantic possibilities okay so this is the notion of textuality and for Bach, this whole process from work 
to text and in uh, that essay the 1971 essay from work to text he talks about seven propositions uh, to mark this transition the, the proposition of the method of genre of sign of uh, plurality of filiation uh, of uh, reading and pleasure these are the seven propositions now i'll try and explain these seven uh, terms uh, seven concepts first is the method now the work uh, the work see that is a term that we all have been using of uh, used for centuries to describe a book a novel or a poem or whatever krithi enna malayalathile vaakkana nammal parayunnu alle adu pole author enna vaakk grantha kartav right kartav enna vaakkana ubhayikkunnu and kartav is also the word that christians use to talk about god kartave kanyaname devamaya kartave adhe vaakkana grantha kartav ennu parayunnu so the idea is that you consider the author as a god like figure it's the author god he is a one who creates he is a one who controls right he sustains the sthiti mella adanguna the sarva vyabhiyaya sarva jnaniyaya adhikariyana deiva sankalpam right aa deivamana grandhakarta appo nammal oru when you read you are always worried about authorial intention is this what the author meant will the author approve of this interpretation so uh, the whole enterprise of literature bab argues is ridiculously centered around the idea of the author and so just as you have god the creator creating the universe and creating all human beings who are god's creations devathinte srushtigalana nammal oru oru thil similarly you have the gods uh, the author gods creations or children which are these books these works work srushti krithi Uh, which is a very uh, a logocentric traditional notion and that is why bach wants to get the author out of the uh, the, the the structure of literature right uh, uh, and uh, this is actually an act of killing god and that is why he co- talks about the death of god because he is actually echoing the nichean call of god's death and nietzsche famously argued that god is dead and uh, there's no god uh and so uh, and this death of god actually liberates humanity this is nietzsche's argument but this actually echoing that nietzschean argument philosophical argument and saying that when you take the uh, the, the god like figure of the author out of reckoning the text liberates itself and then the text has immense possibilities from there on and then each reader in the process of reading constructs the text okay so this is bach's idea of the text and he uses these two terms work to text author to scripter that's the word that he uses the scripter right uh, is the one who uh, releases or arranges these signifiers in a particular order and releases these signifiers into the public domain and that is what we understand as a text so you need to connect all these things text textuality textuality is the the idea of the text as a set of signifiers and only of signifiers uh, and uh, open to uh, multiple or infinite interpretations and and from work to now uh, uh, i go back to the uh, essay from work to text and those seven propositions now the first is method by method what says you know the work is more substantive it is uh, a, 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 a something like a quantity it is palpable the traditional notion of a book it is something that you can hold in your hand right you can you can touch it uh, it has some uh, a certain materiality about it the work you consider it as an entity an object okay whereas a text is actually a quality so the difference between a a material entity uh, a palpable entity and a quality a feeling or a, 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 a you know a, a methodological field that's how he would define the text the text is a methodological the text is an attitude okay now what says this uh, this difference between the work and the text uh, need not be uh, 
you know absolutely related to the the the, the chronology of literature in the sense it's not a a, a, a temporal uh, you know concept uh, like all old works are works and all new contemporary works are texts no but argument is that there can be text even in ancient works even in the classics the and there can and some of the contemporary uh, publications are not necessarily text or there is very little textuality in uh, uh, many of the contemporary works or they are mostly traditional now elsewhere in is uh, famous book as bar is that i'll come to that book but makes a distinction between uh, two kinds of works it's the lisible works and the scriptable works a lisible works or the or readerly that's how it is translated into english is a text where you or which you know how to read you know how to read that book say 19th century realist novel dickens or hardy or any of these popular fiction uh, novels that children read you know how to read it so that is a, 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 a readerly a readerly text a lisible text as against these works you have certain texts which challenge the reader which the reader do not know how the reader does not know how to read uh, some of the postmodern texts or even modernist texts like james joyce's ulysses or t.s eliot's the wasteland you don't know what to do with this text right patike podiya thenga gitte pora da you have these lines what do i do this well there's no one way of reading it there's no uh, you know particular meaning of these lines you have to find your own meanings either ningal valare active aayitt there is this, this intellectual involvement on the part of the reader and it is in fact that very process of reading the text that constructs the text that constitutes the meaning of the text and bath uses the term uh, scriptable or writerly that is the reader has to write even as he is reading appa angane oru distinction undu ee work thamile but you have this uh, the 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 overall uh, difference method methodological difference Uh, between work and text so that's the first point the second point is about uh, rana the work because it is traditional it answers to classifications uh, rhetoric categorizations the hierarchy um, you know the epic the novel uh, the short story or the drama all those rhetoric uh, considerations there is a text as i said earlier is an attitude is a uh, is, is a quality so it does not answer to generic or hierarchical classification so that's the second proposition he makes the third point that he he, he puts forward is uh, this regarding the nature of sign what is the nature of sign well the work is logocentric the uh, radian notion of logocentrism the work believes in the signified the work uh we, you know believes in a a, a a a cogent coherent and consistent meaning behind every structure every palpable or visible uh, structure or peripheral outward structure for every signifier there is a signified right so see so would even though he talked about the arbitrariness of the relationship nevertheless so see so granted a cogent signified to every signifier so that is a logocentric uh, logic behind the work that there is meaning sometimes the meaning is obvious apparent one reading you get it sometimes the meaning is hidden the meaning is secret and then you have to read carefully or maybe you have to seek the help of a professional reader well you call in the literary critic the specialized reader and so he reads and he indulges in uh, what we describe as a hermeneutic exercise the the act of exegesis and so he reads the specialist reader reads and interprets for the hapless uh, reader who cannot make anything out of it now this is the uh, is all about uh, the work because you believe in the signified whereas the text knows no signified at all the text has only signifies 
and so uh, the text is is uh, in, you know uh, is to play relentless infinite play you can only play with signifiers okay so that's the next point and uh, so that is this 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 difference between the two. uh one second muhammad ali how how long can i go muhammad or maybe dr shahina dr shahina yeah yeah how much more time do i have so you can take as much of time no problem really don't really <laughs> i'll go on <laughs> you know uh, i can go on and on talking about bath sir, sir since the this being an inaugural lecture we have no any kind of restrictions today go on sir but the children will be very angry with me i don't want to bother them beyond a point maybe i'll okay let me see how far it goes uh maybe i'll speak for another 20 or minutes or so and then take a few questions we'll wind up by 4:15 okay, or so yeah. all right so 20 minutes then sir okay fine thank you uh so next is the uh idea of uh, of, of plurality now this is again related to the notion of the sign a plurality uh, bark means that uh, it's not about the coexistence of multiple meanings it's not just that the text has several meanings and all these meanings are possible no textuality actually means the negation of meaning that uh, that this is actually a, a, a passover a slipping away from one meaning to another i don't know how to uh, how to explain this in in very uh, traditional terms in logocentric terms it's a very uh, very very post structuralist notion so this is uh, not about having many meanings simultaneously it's about having no meaning at all or, or, or always slipping from one meaning to another so that is the idea of uh, textuality the, the plurality the semantic plurality which is inherent in textuality and then another idea is about filiation uh, which is the parental role that uh, the authors assume the uh, I said earlier that the author is god and what he produces is his work kartava kriti srashtava srishti this is also a kind of uh, parental uh, or filial relationship where bath the death of the author in, in the death of the author bath says the uh, the the author exists before the work he nourishes it he is like the father the parent and the work is his child the father owns the child at least the first few years of his existence right or the child's existence and nourishes it and uh, is responsible and will uh, tell us what it, the child's name is what the child wants and the what the child means all those things so that filial uh, connection so the work has a father the work is always already invariably inscribed by the author but says whereas a text is an often or uh, i don't know if often is the right word or the text knows no father uh, or there's no uh, the, i don't mean that the text is a bastard no it's not in that sense but it's in the sense that uh, that say ravana says famously that he swayambhu ravanan swayambhu so uh, the text is an independent entity it knows no filiation it knows no parent uh, it is uh, <laughs> khalil gibran famously is about about children he warned the parents ningale madavidakale ningale mandatharanga vicharikkirathu ningalde srushtigalana ningade kunnigal ennu ningale vicharikkirathu ningalde srushtigal alla avare avare ningal vera instrument mathramana adu avare bhoomiyade ichchayan avare ningalude bhoomiyil vannu ennu mathrame ullu you have only an instrumental value you don't own them so don't treat your children as if you own them you uh, they are your possessions kalil gibran famously said so uh, it's a similar kind of argument that uh, the text has no filiation then uh, the next point is about reading uh, okay uh, okay i take that 
Okay. Oh, all right. I'll stick to English. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter even if I use a smattering of Malayalam. Whatever I have to say, I'll say in English. This is just a, a, a kind of a bonus offering to the Malayali students listening to me. That's all. I won't say any secrets in Malayalam, okay? Then uh, the next point is about, about reading. Yeah. Now, the work is meant for consumption. The operative logic of reading a work is consumption. So the reader is consuming. It's a passive activity. Whereas the operative logic of a text is play. It's a ludic activity. You cannot just sit in an armchair like I'm doing those and be relaxed and then uh, read a text. No, you have to engage with the text all the time because you're the one who is producing the meaning. You're the one who is constituting meaning. You're the one who would, uh, would do the structuration of the narrative. Right? So uh, you have to be involved all the time. Okay, so this is an activity of play, of relentless play. Uh, so that is, uh, somebody is trying to say something? Okay, and then fire, the last point is about pleasure. The work, because it is meant for passive consumption, may at the most give you pleasure, happiness. Uh, you read a work, you get all the meanings, you're happy, you're satisfied, you feel good, ah, beautiful story. You close it, that's it. Whereas a text, uh, well, you cannot close the reading of a text. It doesn't get uh, over. Uh, you can you can never completely finish reading a text. And uh, because you're playing with it, because you have the uh, possibility of playing in with it again and again, which is a relentless or a non-stop activity, you get not just pleasure, but ecstasy or juices. So, uh, uh, I think it is Surya. Surya, can you please mute your microphone? Surya, thank you. Thank you, Surya. Okay. So, that is about uh, the... Uh, the text. So, from work to text. These are the seven propositions that uh, he makes. Okay, I'll uh, stop it here and then go to another very important book. Uh, wonderful book. A unique book of its kind. Roland Barthes' book. S. Bar is it. Now, this is actually a reading of a story by Balzac. Now, he begins this famous essay on the death of the author by referring to Balzac's story, Sarazin. In this story, Sarazin, Balzac, talking about uh, uh, the narrator uh, seeing a castrat to disguise as a female singer. That's how the essay begins. Now, that story by Balzac, uh, it is given as the appendix in this book, it runs to about 34 pages, yes. 34 pages, that story. And Bach has produced a, a reading or analysis of the story in 215 pages. So a 34-page story by Balzac is given a 215-page analysis. Wonderful, wonderful book. Typical bath, again a book of fragments, very, very uh, idiosyncratic uh, and uh, uh, post structure list, semiotic, all those things. You also have this the, the, the bit of stru the structure list logic in uh, operation as well. So Bath is trying to identify and explain the structuration of the narrative. Now, how does he do that? He, now, uh, this S bar is a, that's a typical structureless binary, you know. For example, when you teach phonology or when you learn phonology, you talk about the voiceless sibilant and the voice disibilant, right? The, the, the difference between sir and z, okay? The difference between sing and zoo, 
uh, and the, the zoo is a voiced sibilant, right? So, uh, unfortunately, Malayalis don't use that, uh, that uh, or believe in that voice at all. So, the Malaya, a typical and Malayali goes to the zoo and watch and looks at the zebra rather than going to the zoo and seeing the zebra, right? So, you can take this as a as that uh, binary, a phonemic binary, S bar Z, which is a structuralist argument. But in Balzac's story, there are two main important characters. There is a sculptor called Zarasi, and there is a singer, Zambinella. So this S stands for Zarasi, and Z stands for Zambinella. Now, this it's a wonderful story, actually. Uh, Balzac is a brilliant writer, and uh, he is one of Bart's fa favorite writers. And this is one of his favorite stories as well. I don't know if you can call it a short story, it's 34 page long, maybe slightly long short story or a novella to be precise. Uh, Bath uses five quotes, which again is a structuralist uh, mechanism or, 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 or technique using quotes. So he identifies five quotes and he names these quotes hermeneutic, prioritic, semic, symbolic and cultural. And each pertaining to particular uh, values. Uh, prioritic, for example, is about the actions uh, that take place, the events or the actions that uh, take that characters do. Uh, hermeneutic is about the interpretative uh, uh, sweep of the narrative. That you know. similarly with semic and symbolic and uh, cultural, they are all quotes, quotes to read the text. And using these five quotes, Bath identifies several units of meaning and he calls these units of meaning as lexias. Lexia, L-E-X-I-A. Alexia, you know, the same as lexical, uh, uh, well, you know, about meaning. So, lexia. So, he identifies several uh, units of meaning. Now, using these five different quotes, he is actually uh, splitting up the narrative into several units, smaller units. And in the process of reading this story, Bath identifies 561 units of meaning. Okay, 561 lexias. Now, this is Bath's reading of the story. Okay, it does not mean that there are these 561 units of meaning already inherent in the text. No. Bath is identifying these many meanings. Another reader, if I read, maybe I'll get only 100 lexias. Another reader might get only uh, 200 lexias. Maybe if the reader were to read this, he might get a 1,000 or 2,000 lexias. Right? So it's a reader who actually brings the lexia or who, who, who constructs the lexias, who identifies the lexia, lexias. Right? And similarly, Bath uses five codes. Maybe... I may not use all five quotes. I may not even uh, think of these five quotes. Or maybe somebody else will have more quotes than five. So this is just a method of reading. And a brilliant uh, analysis or analytical exercise, a textual analysis. And perhaps the, the most famous example in, uh, in literary history of uh, the textual analysis of a narrative. So that is uh, this book. Uh, okay, then hmm, I'll just uh, say a few observations about uh, intertextuality and end the session. Uh, and then I'll take questions. I can already see that uh, some of you are posting questions in the chat box. Fine, please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, based on anything that I've already said, or maybe something you want to ask about somebody about Roland Barthes. Uh, now, intertextuality, as I've already mentioned, it's a term coined by Julia Kristeva related to Bakhtin's uh, dialogic uh, imagination, the ideas of polyphony or the, the interconnectedness of speech. Now, for Bath, this has larger implications on literature. Uh, what it means is that uh, every text is intertext. What do you mean by intertext? Intertextuality means, simply means that every text is related to all other texts. 
that no text is original no text is new no text can ever be absolutely original or new i don't know if you are uh, comfortable with this proposition or if you would agree with me the, uh, perhaps there are creative writers here people who write poetry or who write short stories now if you are a poet let me put this question to you how do you know that what you are writing is a poem suppose you have written a poem and you bring it to your teacher to, or your show your friends how do you know that this is a poem why do you call it a poem well you call it a poem because you've already you're already familiar with the form of poetry okay you're already familiar with the genre the formalist expectations of the genre its conventions its methods all those things the uh, figurations the uh, the figures of speech the uh, figures of uh, rhetoric those prosodic features all those things you are a reader first okay and this familiarity with earlier text is what has enabled you to produce a text of your own so you have actually borrowed the very genre the form and also the method of convention right so that so that's the first thing then second point is that what about the words that you have used have you created any of these words no you have just borrowed words from the larger system of resources called language but the current point is that everything belongs to language language is the owner not the author or not any anything else so you are only borrowing words from this immense resource house repertoire called language all these words have already been used by a billion times innumerable times by innumerable people right so what you are actually doing is you are rearranging familiar words existing words in a particular pattern even while borrowing that very pattern or that model and following certain convention that's again the third point the use of uh, metaphoric language the particular uh, you know figurations uh, technical devices simile metaphor all those things so everything is borrowed and you can uh, you know it, it, it's a, you know almost like the argument about uh, the six degrees of separation that they make in uh, sociology that uh, it, it goes like this you know that you everybody is known to everybody else that the maximum is six degrees of of, of, of separation i mean uh, for example I, mean, i know joe biden biden american president not directly perhaps but indirectly i know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows joe biden that's the six degrees of uh, separation for example i know manu espillay the historian uh, is a friend manu espillay was uh, working with uh, shashi theru dr shashi theru so i may not know shashi theru personally but i know manu espillay who knows shashi theru shashi theru might know so many american uh, senators and one senator knows joe biden see six degrees of separation similarly uh, i'm just not an exact analogy i'm just uh, trying to put across that argument that logic that's all similarly if you take a text you can see how this text is related to so many other texts intertextuality is not about ts eliot using shakespeare's line or word or expression in in the wasteland no intertextuality totally the, uh, the 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 inherent nature of language it is the necessary condition of literature according to julia kristeva so all texts are related to all other texts you know you can relate it to the derridian notion of dissemination and trace how every text contains all other texts and there is a famous argument in writing and different there is only one book and that book is written in all the numerous or innumerable books in the world it is all one book it's just said that one book is written as different books 
you have that argument in uh, in, in in writing and difference okay uh, or uh, foucault uh, making a similar argument in the archaeology of knowledge allow me to quote that the frontiers of a book are never clear cut beyond the title the first lines and the last full stop beyond its internal configuration and its autonomous form it is caught up in a system of references to other books other texts other sentences it's a node within a network the book is not simply the object that one holds in one's hands its unity is variable and relative this is foucault uh, writing in 1974 in the archaeology of knowledge i want to come back to bath and end this argument bath uses a metaphor of uh, of texture and he he's he he shows us how these words are related text textile texture all these come from the same root of threads of several threads put together ira in malayalam so uh, the metaphor is that of weaving and he actually talks about it in the death of the other that uh, that uh, the text is actually a structure that cannot be pierced it is a, it's like a piece of cloth where you can see how the thread goes and uh, where all the thread goes uh, up and down and in between and you can just run the thread that's all uh, you can see how it is structured but inside it well there is nothing that is the nature of anything that is written in and through language okay uh, i think it's 4:15 now so i'll stop here uh, and maybe take a few questions thank you thank you sir it was a wonderful presentation and i really loved it because uh, you know in less than 2 hours you have kind of you know given a complete almost complete idea to, about roland bath not not complete in that aspect but you know being teachers who are uh, assigned to teach literary theory in classes you often found it, find it very difficult you know to deal Uh, this kind of topics in a you know short span of time but the way you did it uh, in less than 2 hours especially foregrounding baths and you know interestingly most often when i have to teach baths or other theorists as as a theorist who as you rightly mentioned somebody who I, was against talking about other we never much about the life of but uh, the you know events from his life you mentioned here were really you know insightful and it was something really new to me as a person thanks a lot for you know giving this wonderful lecture and as you said we have time to this i think this link will expire in expire at 4:30 so we have 15 more minutes with us so some questions are already been asked in the chat box and if there are any other questions as supplementary to those we can take them and continue till 4:30 so open to discussion okay so what do i do or shall i read that question and try to respond to those questions or maybe can i can i read for yes sir you you can actually start responding to them so that if there are any other questions they can also type okay. there in the chat okay. box and you can take it all right all right all right Okay, Vishal Raj asks a question. The time and literature itself is marginalized. People are either indulging in other activities or spending time on cinema web series. How far? bath is relevant given that he primarily dealt with writing particularly text well uh, my answer would be that uh, bath uses the term writing in the larger uh, context not necessarily about the institution of literature so uh, this is the postructuralist position also that these are all forms of ecritor right uh, uh, Perida talks about grammatology, or anything that can be inscribed. So, whether it's web series or whether it's uh, advertisements, whether it's uh, 
and, you know, there is always this, uh, this logic of the uh, signifier and the plurality of, uh, of, of, of meaning and all that. So uh, you need not uh, reduce writing to the traditional sense would be my response. Okay. Then the Bath would have uh, uh, really had a great time analyzing our contemporary uh, postmodern expressions and all these things. He was uh, way ahead of his time, actually. Uh, he was, uh, you know, one of the earliest uh, to talk about these cultural uh, texts. Today, this is the bread and butter uh, of uh, the practitioners of cultural studies, right? So Bath did this in 1954-55, in a full decade before the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Culture Studies was inaugurated in 1964, and which was the starting point of uh, culture studies as we all know. So Bath was doing culture studies even before that term was introduced. Then, okay, so the next question, scholarly lecture, literary theories and criticism are monotonous, but always on, okay, thank you. Thank you, Papi, thank you for that compliment. Vishal Raj, again, some of the contemporary cultural discourses argue that writings on the social media, Instagram, Facebook, should be considered as the popular literature of all time. Certainly, yes, I completely agree. What is your stand on that? Where do you locate Baths today in the light of the above mentioned? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Bath would have been very popular in the social media as well. And uh, he would have, uh, you know, considered this as, a, as the, as, uh, to use the Habermas concept of the public domain, the public sphere, right? Uh, because the social media, say a medium like Facebook, Anybody can open an account and uh, express his or her opinion, and you can have this this free exchange of uh, ideas. Some of uh, the uh, very significant um, publications today are happening on the social media, not in the traditional print media. Uh, if you look at uh, some of uh, our, uh, our contemporary writers, uh, they publish their creative stuff, original, whether it's poetry or critical essays. They they. they publishing it in the new media rather than wait for a Madhur Bhumi or a Bhasha Boshni or any of these literary journals to publish it after several months or, you know, editorial scrutiny and all that. So, yeah, that is where all the discussion is taking place, the social media and the new media. No doubt. Ashwadi, uh, when I taught mythology, I was about to fall for Bhadi. You like to meet me to head over heels in love. That is indeed a Oh, yes, Ashwadi, I fondly remember uh, your company and the, the that meeting in 2014. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and thank you for responding. Okay, so that's all of our messages. If uh, anybody wants to ask the students, undergraduate, undergraduate No. Okay. 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 If there are no more questions, we can wind up the session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So I would like to invite uh, Nandana, third semester MS student of uh, Unity Women's College, Manjeri, to propose formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it echoing? Yeah, Nandana, you're audible. Yes, yeah. thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. We have come to an end of the informative session on structure, sign, and writing, the text of Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes, uh, a name that we came across the meta methodology text. His, uh, he's famous for his notion on the birth of a reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. So, Roland Barthes has indeed widened the interpretation and understanding of the text and all. So uh, I really uh, convey my heartfelt vote of thanks to the inaugural lecturer, uh, Josie Joseph, sir, 
for sharing his insights on Roland Barthes. And this this talk was really fruitful, and we are honored to hear it, uh, to hear about Barthes from a scholar on Barthes. And uh, we could literally feel your obsession with uh, Barthes when you speak about him and the books that you have uh, uh, introduced us as shown as. Uh, 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 ways to dig deeper and explore on Bhartas more and more, and I thank uh, uh, I mean, thank you so much, sir, for all these things. And I thank Dr. A K Shahina Mol, uh, uh, our dearest H O D, uh, for her uh, noble words as the uh, welcome note. And I thank uh, Dr. C Seidal Lavi, sir, for his uh, felicitation and constant support to coordinating such programs. And I also thank. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Abdul Rashid sir the principal of EMA college for his warm felicitations and i thank uh, both research club uh, research club and the department of english of both EMA college and KHM unity women's college for organizing such a fruitful org- uh, online lectures and uh, i convey my special thanks to uh, Abdul Jalil sir for his sincere efforts to coordinate and host this whole session and let me conclude uh, i thank all the teachers and students from the edis colleges for attending this session and making it making it successful thank you so much to everyone thank you thank you nandana thank you can thank i have can i have just one word yes sir more yeah. please more, please uh, uh, actually there are several more titles uh, with me some of these are posthumous publications some of these recent uh, uh, you know english translations uh, of uh, the essays and uh, smaller articles that Bo- Bath uh, wrote and published in various French journals. Uh, but I didn't have time to go through all these things. Uh, Nantana, you're right that I'm really uh, fascinated uh, by Roland Bath. And the more I read of him, the more I like this so much. Uh, you know, he feels like a contemporary. So I'm not a scholar. I'm still a learner. and But I'm happy that... Uh, you all liked my presentation uh, thank you uh, thank sir, you for, thank more, you for one, one more thing so we have recorded this session so we, if you okay with it we can upload it in our youtube channel okay okay, okay. thank you sir okay thank okay. you thank you yeah thank you so much sir thank you thank you dr shahid